Entriamo nel clou della, della giornata con l'intervento del professor Benjamin Barber. Buongiorno, e that is as much Italian as you will hear from me this morning. Thank you very much for permitting me to come to this extraordinary city and speak English and listen to me in English. Being in the Palazzo, Palazzo Vecchio with you, with Mayor Rienzi, with Mayor Fasino of Torino, with the Mayor of Bologna, and all of you is a great privilege for an American. I have been often in Italy and often in Firenze. I am not quite as old as the Palazzo, but I was first here in 1957 as a student in Switzerland. And it's always an extraordinary pleasure to come back to the cities of Italy because Italy is a nation of cities, first of all. And as I understand the crisis here in governance, much like the crisis in the United States of government, and we have similar crises, different causes, but the same crisis. National governments that are increasingly dysfunctional and unable to deal with the pace of the economy, with global trade and global relations. And in my new book, If Mayors Ruled the World, I am basically inviting us to change the subject. To change the subject from nation states, which we have been talking about for 400 years, to cities. To change the subject from prime ministers and presidents to mayors and city councillors who are doing the real work on the ground of governance. Being in Florence is a particularly appropriate place for this message because like so many of Italy and Europe's cities, Florence existed as a city-state before there was an Italian nation. I don't want to say Florence will exist as a city after there is an Italian nation because we hope the Italian nation will continue, but we know the cities of Europe and the cities of the world are older and more fundamental to the everyday life of people than the nation states in distant capitals. My message this morning then is that it is time for us to think more about the role that cities are playing in the world today and the way in which they can achieve many of the things that it is more difficult for large bureaucratic national governments to achieve. We begin with an irony. The irony is that the ancient city, the ancient polis, the ancient city-state was too small for the emerging societies and territorial nations of the 15th and 16th century and the nation-state, the état-nation, was an invention which allowed us to take democracy and government to a larger scale than the city. But here is the irony after 400 years of the nation state, we live again in a world whose global scale, whose global interdependence makes the nation state inadequate to global affairs, to globalization, and to interdependence. We live in a world, and the businessmen here know it, and the artists here know it, and the mayors know it. We live in a world with disease without borders, with war and terrorism without borders, with crime 
without borders, with trade and immigration without borders, with markets without borders. But we do not have citizens without borders. We do not have democracy without borders. We still live inside the national boundaries invented four or 500 years ago. And in a global world of interdependence, we need political institutions capable of dealing globally. And my suggestion is that by going back to the city, we can go forward. By going back to the polis, we go forward to the cosmopolis. That cities today are not only the political institutions that still work well, the political institutions still trusted by citizens much more than they trust the nation state, but that cities are also the political institutions that when they work together across borders, when they cooperate, when they reach out to one another, not just in the American Conference of Mayors or the Italian Municipal League or the European Euro cities, but when they reach out across the world, they are capable of dealing with the issues of climate change, economic trade, immigration, yes, and even terrorism and disease and war in powerful ways. And that is why in the United States today, new mayors in New York like de Blasio and Garcetti in Los Angeles and others around the country are taking leadership when President Obama has been unable to achieve his agenda in Washington. 30 years ago, the mayors of the United States used to go to Washington and ask for help. In December, President Obama invited 15 new mayors, including de Blasio and Garcetti, to Washington so he could ask them for help in solving the problems of Washington. For that reason, it does not surprise me that here in Italy, people look for leadership from the mayors of the great industrial cities of Italy. It does not surprise me that Mayor Rienzi of Florence, some people think, should be, in effect, the mayor of Italy. Others think he should be the mayor of Europe. Mayor Bloomberg of New York already has the title mayor of the world. But mayors are playing an extraordinary role. And the question is why cities are so able to do what is so difficult for nation states to do. And let me give you a couple of hints, a couple of clues about why I think cities continue to thrive when nation states are too large for democracy and participation and too small for the global nature of our challenges today. Cities are first of all where we are born, where we grow up, where we are educated, where we get married, where we work, where we pray and play and get old and die. When I come to Italy and see friends, new friends and old friends, they talk about their identification with their city. I had dinner last night with Michel Angelo and he told me first of all about his citizenship of Florence and he told me about where he lived and the restaurant we went to, an old restaurant, 250 years old, Paolo. He spoke about his identity first of all as a man of Firenze then as an Italian, then as a European. If you ask me who I am, I will not say I'm an American, I'll say I'm a New Yorker. I'm from New York. We all identify with the cities 
that define the warp and the woof, the everyday aspects of our life. The city is the human community, first of all, all the way back to the ancient world and still today. When we despair of our national political institutions, when we worry that Washington and Rome and London cannot fix our problems, when Beijing and Tokyo are not able as national capitals to solve things, we go back and think about Yokohama and Chongqing and Lyon and Bologna and Torino and yes, Ferenci because that defines how we live, where we live, who we are. So cities have a powerful position as the fundamental and essential human communities. And those who govern cities are seen rather differently than those who govern nations. Because a mayor is first of all a neighbor who has become a political official, a public official but he's from the neighborhood. There's a phrase in America, we talk about homeboys, homies. Mayors are homies, they're homeboys and homegirls. They're from the neighborhood. They're of the people. When Cory Booker, now a United States Senator, was the mayor of Newark until just recently, several times on the way to driving to work, he left his automobile, went into a building, and pulled people from a fire. He stopped a mugging, a crime in the street because he was a neighbor. He did what any neighbor would do. That makes mayors pragmatists and problem solvers. Their goal is to fix things and make them work. You know last fall in the United States, we closed the government of the United States for almost two weeks. And the astonishing thing was nobody noticed. The government of Washington closed and nobody noticed. Some would say the government of Italy has been closed for many years. And you noticed, but life goes on. But close Florence for a day, close Bologna, close Milano close Palermo for one day. No police, no fire, no buses, no schools, no hospitals, no services. It's not possible. You cannot close a city. You can close a national government. You cannot close a city and mayors know it. A mayor does not have the luxury of standing on ideological principle and doing nothing. Mayors have to solve a problem. Mayor de Blasio of New York has been in office for three weeks and he has had six snowstorms in that time. And his first job is to clear the snow and if he doesn't do that, it doesn't matter what else he does. He cannot have an ideological argument about the weather. He cannot be a meteo socialist or a meteo conservative. He must clear the snow one way or the other. He must solve problems. He must make the economy work. At the national level of government, we can argue about whether we are a socialist and believe in a greater public economy or we are a conservative or a liberal and believe in a greater market economy. But in the city, you deal with unions and you deal with business and you deal with civil society or you cannot govern. There's no way you can govern with one part or just another part of the society. A city is a whole and mayors work by consensus, by coalition by reaching out to every part of the city and including every part of the city. That's why in many parts of the world, mayors no longer identify with party. In England, the new mayor of Bristol, George Ferguson, is the first mayor 
elected in England who does not belong to the Tories or the Socialists. Mayor Bloomberg of New York. First he was a Democrat, then he was a Republican, and when he became mayor, he said, I am an independent. I do not belong to this party or that party. I am the mayor of New York, and my challenge is to bring New York together and make it work together. And that's what mayors do everywhere. It's the same in Singapore. It's the same in Seoul, Korea. I met Won Soon Park, the mayor of Seoul, Korea, last year. And although he's a, he has a party in governing Seoul, he cannot afford to let the party dictate what he does. Democracy about which we are so skeptical today, democracy in which young people no longer believe, democracy which in the Arab Spring has brought only disappointment, still works in the city. Democracy and participation are still alive and well in the city. Institutions like participatory budgeting, where citizens make choices in how budgets are expended. Participatory zoning, in which citizens are included in zoning decisions. That still happens in the cities. In the United States and in many other places, if you measure trust in national governments, the trust is 30 percent, 20 percent. The trust Americans have in their own Congress is 8 percent. 92 percent of Americans do not trust the Congress they elect. But when you ask people, do you trust the mayor? Do you trust the city council of your town? The numbers go up to 70, 75 percent still. The city, the town remains the one place where people still trust that democracy has some meaning. And in a world cynical about democracy, which is a crisis for us in the West, to have a political institution people still believe in, that people still think the city counts, that people still think they can trust the mayor's word, that is a powerful thing for democracy because without trust there can be no democracy and without democracy the republic fails. So the city is playing a new and vital role. But in playing that role it faces a number of challenges. And I know for you today here in Florence you are dealing with some of those challenges. The most important challenge is this. The city in many ways represents the economic and cultural force of a nation. 80% of GDP comes from cities. This is true everywhere, not just in Italy. 80% of the productivity of a nation comes from its great cities. But those cities do not have the autonomy and the jurisdiction and the competences to exercise the power they need to make good on their economic and cultural promise. And part of that is the result of a problem you deal with. When we define cities in the 16th and 17th and 18th century, the city was defined narrowly, the old city walls, the old city maps. The city was a small and narrow confine. But cities today are not just cities, they are metropolitan regions. The city of Milano is not inside the old walls. The city of Bologna is not inside the old walls. It extends to the territory around it in terms of its economy, in terms of its culture, in terms of its transportation, the city is a region. But in terms of its jurisdiction, its laws and its competence, it is still shrunk to a very narrow place. When I talk about how robust 
and vital cities are, people say to me, and what about Detroit? Because Detroit is bankrupt. But let me tell you a small story about Detroit which should reflect on Italy's cities also. The Detroit that is bankrupt is a small, limited Detroit whose boundaries were drawn 200 years ago. That Detroit is bankrupt. That Detroit has lost two-thirds of its population. In 1950, Detroit was the fourth largest city in the United States, two million. Today, Detroit has 700,000. It's lost two-thirds of its population. Half its schools are closed, the parks are closed, the buildings are abandoned. Yes, Detroit is bankrupt. But if you look at the 10 counties around Detroit that make up the greater Detroit metropolitan region, those 10 counties have gone from 3 million to 5 million. Those 10 counties have much of the industry that left downtown Detroit, but is still in the greater Detroit region. The automobile industry is still there. And those 10 counties are the fourth richest and most prosperous new economy zone of the United States. Detroit, defined by the greater Detroit metropolitan region, is flourishing. But we have not redrawn the districts. And the challenge Italy faces now is to redraw its map so that ancient notions of province and intermediate associations do not intersect and stand in the way of the real growth and flourishing of metropolitan regions. The city should be defined by its economy, its transportation, its cultural penumbra, by the people it serves. And when you define the city that way, it represents 80% of the population. It represents 82% of GDP. So how you draw the map of cities, whether you have a national government and a city government, or as in Germany, you have a national government, a Land, a federal level and a city level, or as in Italy, you have four or more levels intersecting and confusing, is of the utmost importance. It is not a technical question. It is a question about the vitality and future of democracy, the vitality and future of capitalism and the capitalist economy. Because the economy cannot flourish if it is restricted by 18th century jurisdictional boundaries. The culture of the city cannot flourish if it is defined by laws that no longer reflect the real growth of cities in the modern world. And the economy cannot flourish if it is limited inside national territories and not permitted to interact across nations. There is no such thing today as a really national corporation. We talk about the multinational corporation. Corporations are global in character. And the reason for that is that the global economy is interdependent and global. No business person can function just inside Torino, just inside Bologna. But we try to make democracy and government function just inside of that. And so I am proposing and working with mayors in many countries to look at the possibility of intercity government, of a global mayor's parliament, a parliament of mayors, where mayors meet regularly, not to give laws to the world, but to share best practices, to understand common challenges and to work together with economic and civic leaders to make possible the kind of growth and flourishing that corporations and civil society already has. It is a great challenge that we live in a world where Al-Qaeda is a global 
malicious, malevolent, non-governmental organization, but democracy is still limited inside cities. We need a political structure. We need a civic structure as global and interdependent as the reality of the modern world, and cities can help us do that. Cities can help us get there. That's why more and more when people look for solutions, not just to local problems, but to national problems, they look to mayors. And I joked before, but it is not a surprise that Mayor Rienzi is seen as a potential leader for the nation because it is in cities that effective politics and effective democratic leadership is found. And for that very reason, in the United States, people look at Garcetti. People look at de Blasio and say, this may be a leader who can help the nation because in cities, they don't argue ideology, they fix problems. In cities, they don't stand on principle. They run with change and they make things happen because they have to. So the challenge here today that you all face in thinking about the relationship between the city and the economy, between the public sector and private business, is to find an accommodation that allows cities to help business become engines of growth for the region, for the nation, and for the world, to find political institutions as large and broad as the world itself, to deal with the challenges of climate change globally and not just locally. There is no Lombardy warming. There is no Italian warming. There is no New York warming. There is global warming global climate change, and we need global cooperation to do it. The mayor of Rome is not with us today because he is in Johannesburg, South Africa with the C40, where cities are trying to figure out how to challenge climate change together. That is your challenge today. Private and public sectors, mayor and business leaders, to help redraw the constitutional map of Italy so that cities and metropolitan regions can work together with business and the private sector to recreate the democracy and republicanism that have long made Italy a leader of the world when we think about freedom, when we think about markets, when we think about democracy. I have great hope for Italy because I have great hope for Italy's cities, Italy's businesses, and Italy's mayors. And it's a privilege to be here to talk to you. Thank you for listening to me, and good luck with your work this morning. Thank you very much.